Okay, everybody, welcome to Sony NAB Live. Uh, I am Marty McPadden, and we are here for another show. Uh, this time we are going to cover 4K in sports production, and I have a very special guest here with me, uh, Mike DeRoches, Senior Sales Support Engineer, Western Region, Sony Professional Solutions of America. And Mike, I don't know if you want to tell the folks a little bit more about you, or? Uh, sure. Before um, we get into the questions? Yeah. Uh, I've been, uh, great story, I think. I started as an intern at Sony. Um, and just got my foot in the door. So like we have many students here working the show, it's kind of a neat way to get some experience in the, uh, in the Sony family, just kick the door open, get going. And so I've you know, kind of matriculated through a number of different roles. But one thing that's really great about working in this company is that we're afforded the opportunity to get out and work with our tools. We have a lot of products. Um, many of you may use some of our products. Um, I imagine that's why you're here. But uh, the last two years, I've actually gone around and been shooting um, games every weekend outside of my job during the week and just kind of driving exposure, saying, hey, we got this great camera. I'll shoot the games. Here's your content. You can have it for free. They walk away with demo content that they can see and use for highlight reels. I walk away with demo content. And I've developed some nice relationships. A couple of people are actually here that uh, can answer some questions afterwards if you have it, um, questions from actual users. But you know, working for this company is kind of a great deal. I'm, I like to talk to people. I like to network. And um, if you guys are interested, we just came out with a uh, digital cinema magazine that's online called Action. It's a Sony digital magazine that just launched yesterday. And a couple of stories uh, with uh, this gentleman over here, Terrence, uh, works for the University of Washington. And he's shot with a couple cameras in the past uh, using 4K solutions. So he's available to work. And then actually bumped into Sean out here from uh, the Salt Lake City area who uses our F55 um, and shoots in 4K. So. I'm a family guy, and I'm also a networking guy, so it's a, a good gig. That's, that's me in a nutshell, I guess. Excellent. Okay, Mike. And before we get into questions, I want to remind everybody who's watching us online, uh, please tweet Sony NAB, ask your questions, make comments. Uh, <laughs> we will pick a winner of the best question, best comment. We're giving away a Sony Action Cam. And uh, yeah, so why don't we jump right into this, Mike. Um, what in your mind are the biggest values of recording sports in 4K? How many of you guys are sports fans here? Right? You're probably here because you like that, right? I'm a huge sports fan. It may not be so easy right out of the gate to broadcast 4K because 4K, in, by definition, is four times more that than HD. In fact, 4K is a little bit more than four times. So that's a lot of resolution. And if you like to be immersed in the sporting environment, it's something that can really get you there. Right? Well, right now, it may not be so practical to air 4K but to acquire 4K and have that kind of a frame to work with really gives you a lot of flexibility, not only in post, but also in broadcast applications. How many of you guys have watched the Fox broadcasts of the NFL? They've been using 4K cameras for the Joe Buck and Troy Aikman broadcast, their A broadcast, their A team broadcast. And they'll take 4K frames for certain modes when maybe the referee goes under the, under the hood and looks at a replay. And they can zoom in on that 4K frame 600% before they start to break down their 720p video that they're going to air with. That gives them a lot of flexibility to use that as another broadcasting tool that really, really helps add that sort of uh, you know, audience environment. That's also something that can be done in post. So let's say that if you're shooting an interview, and maybe uh, this is an example I've been using with some customers that um, maybe we're going out to spring training. They're shooting an F55. That camera can record in 4K res and HD resolution at the same time to the same piece of media. So they have an inter a chance to interview, say, Vin Scully or Sandy Koufax. This is the Sportsnet LA group that records the Dodgers network. So hey, well, I know that you're working in HD, but why not shoot that interview in 4K because now you can protect that asset and have it on the shelf ready to go to the air, sorry, in 4K, but you also have your deliverable in the format you need in HD. That's a great solution. And in fact, shows in the production space are using that workflow. Shows like the Blacklist, which is shot on F55, are using those kind of dual simultaneous recording modes, as well as a feature that uh, Phil Kogan shot this last summer called LaRide. A number of different things are there. But in the sporting application, it's something that gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of broadcast post as well as you know, all this extra frame to work with um, and, and just to give you that immersive audience or view to where even though it's a 2D plane, it looks yeah. almost three dimensional. Yeah, you raise a good point about the replay. Yeah. Uh, having enough resolution to zoom in, I saw, I saw it a couple of times on Fox and it's decisive in making calls for the yeah. referees. 
Yeah, there, there's actually a, um, and, and what I'm showing here are some of these are shots that I've taken. This was, and this is Terrence right here, who's over here. He was actually using a, one of our FS700 cameras, which is a 4K sensor, but he's actually recording 4K RAW. And in their case, it was kind of unique because they were launching their brand new stadium at the University of Washington. And they had these great boards, but the boards had an, an oblong aspect ratio of like 2,500 by 720 or 800. And 2K wasn't going to fill that up, and he didn't want to stretch it out. So he was thinking, well, I'll shoot 4K and crop it out to where I get really nice imagery for their boards. And using a, a low-cost camera w with a raw recorder, he was able to get that. And uh, you know, he can talk about that later on if that's something you guys want to talk to him about. But he, he had some great success. Um, you know, other applications here would be the ability to, to do a tow-in for 4K. And you can actually get two unmanned cameras to create an 8K frame where you can just zoom around and do a 1080 cutout without having an operator in the, the arena. You actually have somebody in a production truck just operating a joystick that's processing down to a 1080 cutout and moving around and tracking action. So a lot of benefits there for sure. Excellent. Now, if I'm shooting 4K, what does that mean to me in terms of storage capacity? <laughs> uh, have, how many of you guys have are shooting HD right now. I know that we're streaming this, but in, in here. And you guys understand that when you're recording HD and then compressing that down, it's typically, say, 25 megabit in different codecs up to 50 to 100 to 150 to 220. It can be kind of get out of hand real quick. Well, uncompressed HD is 1.3 gigabit per second. And so you whittle that down in a compression scheme to something more manageable. Well, that's HD. If you're talking 4K, it's four times HD just for the quad frame HD, which is 3.8K. Well, you could be looking at 5.2 gigabit per second, and that's just for a 30 megabit or 30 uh, frame per second rate. So how do you get that whittled down? You can shoot RAW, where most RAWs are kind of compressed, or you can shoot it as an encoded file format and still get something that's more manageable. So even though a lot of cameras out there that can do 4K, and I've seen a number of RED cameras and um, you know, uh, some other cameras that are out there, they're shooting in 4K or 5K, but they're mostly recording raw. That's great if you have time to manipulate the signal, but that may not be practical for everybody. If you can get a camera that can encode something in that 4K frame with something that has a color palette that you can easily just drag and drop in your timeline and cut away, now your ability is, is much better and you have a lot more flexibility. So it can be anywhere in the 240 megabit per, fr per second uh, t um, you know, frame size or, or a data size, they say, all the way up to multiple 2.6 gigabits per second if you're shooting raw. So it just depends on what you're doing it as one camera at a time or multiple cameras at a time or what your overall capacity is because if you can do it more efficiently and less cost more cost effective by encoding it, then you're going to be able to do multiple cameras and you know, store it a lot less expensively. But shooting raw gives you more flexibility in post, but it also costs a lot more. And as Terrence can attest, or anybody that's worked in raw can attest, even if you're shooting stills, you got more pliability, but it's a lot of extra work. So the storage capacity can really either put you out of your budget if you're shooting raw, and that's why tools like what we have, where you can encode 10 megabit, 10 megabit um, I'm sorry, 10 bit 4K files, that really allows you to be more economical. Excellent. Now I want to remind everybody here, we got a large crowd here. If anybody has any questions as we go along, raise your hand. Uh, we want to make this interactive, and Lena will get you the mic. Um, going on to lenses, I have a bunch of, uh, well, not me, but if I did, have a bunch of two-thirds inch lenses. How can I use those with larger format sensors? Okay, um, that's a great question, actually, because almost everybody here, I imagine, and a lot of people watching online, own 16 millimeter lenses, two-third inch ENG lenses, and, well, that's an investment I want to make sure I'm leveraging somehow. The nice thing about our cameras in the 4K space, whether it be the FS700 or F5 or F55, is we use a universal mount. So this FZ mount that we use on the F5 and 55 allows you to put virtually any adapter to mount to virtually any lens that exists in the world. We also have camera tools in, or camera menus inside that allow you to zoom in from that 4K to 2K and allow you to simply just mount a 60 millimeter lens because you're basically zooming in on that and blowing that up to fill the frame from a 60 millimeter sensor or a 230 sensor to fill that super 35 millimeter. So those are just menu selections, but it's nice that the flexibility in our system allows you to use virtually any lens out there in the market. And you know, there are groups like the, the San Francisco 49ers. This is actually showing um, their 55 with um, Able CineTech. Every camera of ours comes with an FZ to PL adapter, and they're actually using the Able CineTech PL to B4 bayonet adapter, the HDX35, 
And so now that allowed the Niners to throw on their cannon glass that they had, and they bought some brand new glass for that. So that's if they want a longer throw, or they also bought the Fuji Cabrio, that's a shoulder mount, and they have a 19 to 90 with servo grip um, to get 4K type resolution and not take that kind of hit. Because when you're using these adapters, there's going to be either a crop factor and or some type of a stop loss if you're using some type of an optical adapter like that. But the nice thing is, is you can go that route with those adapters, and we have all of those, and those are available. Um, but depending on if you want to use a box lens or something like that, we have build-up kits that support that as well. So R5 and 55s can be adapted to be used as hard cameras in an outside broadcast application as well. And we'll get into the 4K Live stuff in a little bit too. Now, if I don't want a full-size camera and the cost that goes along with it, what options might Sony have for acquiring 4K for sports? Okay, that, that's where we have, uh, this, this is where things get crazy. How many of you guys have purchased or own a D600 in the past? The beta cam solution, D600, okay? This is an old, not even you, Greg? Come on. All right, so how many of you guys uh, have purchased a full-size camera in the last seven years? Okay, and how many of you guys spent over $40,000 for that camera? Okay, which is typically what those would cost. Now, this 4K camera, in the full size guy is 35 grand to list. Then you can get into cameras like the FS700, which is about an $8,000 camera, that's 4K sensor, can do 4K or 2K raw. We also have a Z100, which is a $6,000 camera that can shoot in the exact same codex as the F55, but has a 20 by zoom. We have a $2,000 camera over here on the consumer side, the AX100, that can shoot 4K 30p. And recording it internally to a $2,000 camera. We also have a couple of other cameras, and we, I think we even have a camera phone, that phone that's coming out with a camera that's a half-inch sensor that can do 4K 30p in a camera phone. Oh boy. So wow. there's a lot of options out there yeah. from, um, from a small format. It's just a matter of what is it you want to do. Do you want to shoot 4K? Do you want to oversample 4K? Do you want to natively record HD? but sampling off that 4K, because the best way to, to shoot gorgeous HD is to sample from a higher resolution frame size. Absolutely, now all this 4K acquisition's great, but if you can't watch it at home, that could be an issue. So yeah. I'm hearing a lot about 4K sets available for the home. Uh, when can I watch 4K content at home? What, how, how's that coming along? Okay, so um, how many of you guys have heard of Netflix? Heard of Hulu? There are all these different content providers, primarily in the digital arena, that we're, we are allowing now for streaming, or they're mandating that their original content will be acquired in 4K. That tells you that coming forward, there will be a lot of 4K content being driven to fill these TV sets that are now more commonly available. Those of you that were saying, oh, well, we went through this a couple years ago with 3D. 3D came out, it went away. But that was never an immersive situation, because in a broadcast environment, you're limited to a certain amount of pipe and you pretty much can't get a full HD 3D over that broadcast pipe to where it's immersive on your 40, 50, 60 inch screens. You had to pretty much whittle it down to side by side standard definition resolution to see it and it just didn't really take. On top of that, there wasn't enough content to make that, uh, that content enjoyable. Different story with 4K. 4K is coming, it's gonna be here before you think about it. Where it's going to be difficult is for the broadcast transmission because they're still limited to pipe. Now, that being said, um, a couple of things I want to say here. Uh, about a month ago, I was in Denver, and I happened to tour the Comcast Media Center where they, um, Comcast is involved with NBC and all that stuff. And uh, they had shot with a couple of our cameras out there in 4K, and they were using the XAVC codec. So they weren't shooting raw. They were shooting in the 4K XAVC, which is basically at that point, they were shooting 25p and 50p, and so that was 250 megabit or 500 megabit, respectively. They were taking those 10-bit files and compressing it down in an H.265 uh, encoder and getting it to where it could be broadcast. And they had these sort of new forward thinking, one of the six sets that they had domestically that could play that. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a Sony 4K display and they had a little bit of a server that was feeding these files that were convinced, condensed down to 20 megabit. To see a 20 megabit file encoded and played into a 4K set that was a 60 inch set, I was blown away at how well it held up. So it's common, it's just a matter of how quickly can you encode those big chunks of files and get it down to something that can be broadcast? I don't think broadcast is going to be around anytime soon, yeah. maybe a couple of years. But the downloads, the near on demand kind of stuff, that's where it's actually all Download at. Download to a server and then yes. you play it. So you'll see it on Netflix. Now, 
have a question. Uh, how many of you guys have seen, there's, there's a Netflix, for, well, it's, it's a Netflix documentary called The Short Game. Any of you guys seen it? I saw it last year at, uh, at South by Southwest. It's about seven-year-old golfers, and um, they're competing on the nationwide scale from all over the world. It was shot on the, the C300, and it's a great-looking, great-looking uh, feature. When I found out that Netflix bought it, I was like, hey, that's great. It's now a Netflix original. But what I'm wondering is, did they have the foresight to shoot that feature in 4K? Because Netflix is going to be driving stuff in 4K. And as good as that documentary looks, and I, I recommend you all to go check it out. It's called The Short Game. You can stream it live tonight um, for free, or if you have a, a, a subscription. But if they didn't protect it in 4K and shoot 4K where they can deliver that, I would be disappointed. And that's where it comes into, you gotta think about it. If you have a tool that can do 4K, and you're gonna go to the big screen, you gotta protect it at the highest quality you can because it's gonna give her longer legs as an asset. You can sell that, make more money off of that asset. Because if they don't have it in 4K, I'm gonna be really disappointed because it looked great, but it could be their standard for the 4K as a deliverable. Hey, I wanna download this, great. But if they didn't, now you don't have that. That's why it's important when you have these specialty projects or anything like that, shoot in 4K, and at the very least, you'll have an oversample of great HD. And you can move around in your framing size and do a wide shot of a two, two shot and say, okay, I'm gonna zoom in at 1080 here for a one shot, zoom in here at 1080 at a two shot, and intercut it like a two camera shoot, but I only had one fixed camera that wasn't even manned. So there's a lot of flexibility there, but the TV, and so there's a long answer, but the TV primarily is going to be uh, kind of download and then stream yeah. to feed these 4K displays that are becoming more common out there. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. We did get a question in previously online and from Ron Pryor. Will the 2015 Super Bowl be broadcast in 4K? I don't know. If you... <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I, I don't work for NBC. Um, as far as I understand, they'll be carrying the Super Bowl this year. Um, however, because of what I just mentioned with the pipe being so narrow, and in terms of broadcasting it live, that would require quite a bit of infrastructure, and H.265 would have to be further down the line to be able to do that live, and then we'd have to be set-top boxes, or not set-top boxes, but 4K boxes that can, or sets that can receive that. So if it were available, which I don't necessarily see happening live, it would be to very limited audience. What I do think would be cool is if NBC, which happens to own, I think, Hulu, right, or have some sort of relationship with interest, Hulu, yeah. um, well, I know that they're going to be going 4K at some point, so if they had the foresight, or maybe for future Super Bowl um, negotiation rights, they could say, hey, we're going to basically pay the $2 billion or whatever it is to, to carry the Super Bowl, but we're going to make sure that we're able to provide this as a view after the fact asset that we can now share as part of our service because that's something that if it's a great game, a lot of people are going to watch that after the fact. Of course, NBC is going to say, well, wait, I don't want CBS digital content or, or Netflix that is not part of my thing. I don't want them having rights that I paid this money. Yeah. But if it's NBC that paid the money and their subsidiary, Hulu, can utilize that asset, I would think that, hey, well, my advertisers are paying all this money for the live broadcast rights. Well, you know what? I can also leverage that into a, a Hulu kind of download thing. I think that's the way that would make some sense. Absolutely. I uh, want to open up to, we have a pretty good crowd here. Anybody have a question for? This is the AX100, by the way. So a $2,000 camera. Maybe I could just point to some of these slides since I can't see go. when they were rolling. but. If you want to just kind of go through and I can explain what some of these things are. That would be a very high res version of the Z100. Next slide. That's my boy Terrence over here. This is a handheld camera. So he's holding the FS700 with an EF adapter using his Canon glass. And what you see there is uh, he's actually a cable that goes, so he's running handheld, but it's a cable running into a 4K recorder, which he actually was running on his, his back, so almost like the old two-piece days, but that way you can be mobile. Yep. Uh, here he is again, using that over the top during the coin toss. There's the Niners and their, uh, their 55. Now, one thing that's great about the Niners is they purchased their three F55s prior to the season starting. Right? And they wanted to really kind of ramp up their digital uh, content and their, 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 their ramp up the number of eyes that they're drawn to the website. 
So they went out and they bought three of the F-55s, and they got a great execution uh, executive producer that ex executes some great um, stories and builds all these things up, and a great team there. But they were able to leverage the glass that they already had, buy some new lenses. They went with the, the, the HD recording, the 4K RAW. They did high frame rate in HD. And they, they bumped up their website content and their presence 360% in terms of the numbers of eyes going there. And that was three times more than any other team in the league. So it's been a huge hit for them. Their stadium, how many of you guys are aware that they're building a new stadium out there that'll start this year, I believe, Levi Stadium. So, yeah, you're from Seattle, you're like, I don't care. <laughs> Right. But, but they initially were looking at a full-size hard cameras, uh, the 2500s, like, for instance, the Dodgers just had a big uh, install, and they used those cameras. But instead of getting their six or seven of those, they said, well, wait a second. We had such success with these F55s as field production cameras shooting 4K and HD. We have a 4K live solution, which allows you a fiber back on the back of these to where, like, wow, if we can use those for live in-game cameras doing 4K or HD or flip the switch to 4K when we want to feed these boards, but then when we're not doing live in-game broadcasts, we can just take off the back panel, and now we actually have six or seven other field production cameras to really, really get a ton of content. That made so much sense for Rob and his team, and that's the direction they wound up choosing. Uh, that makes a lot of sense absolutely, to me. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so another slide here, until we get a question or any questions from the, yeah, the web. Very quiet crowd here. There's another uh, adapter. So the nice thing is, is that adapting to lenses that you may already have or new lenses that provide some flexibility for your uh, recording applications. Actually, Mike, we have a question coming in online, I believe, right? Uh, and we're going to pot up uh, Lena's mic yep. in the back there. <laughs> we're getting a question in through Twitter from Lisa Bell. She's asking, when you crop in 4K, does it lose the image quality? OK. So the question is, if you, if you crop in 4K, do you lose image quality? If you are doing a crop and you're recording in 4K, you're going to be doing a, a doubler, and at that point, you would lose resolution. However, if you're shooting in HD, if your recording format is in HD, but you're sampling from 4K in what we call the full mode or the normal mode, it's going to be an oversample to get your HD. But when you do the center crop, it's still going to be 2K, which is more resolution than HD. It's going to effectively double the, fo the, the, the focal length of your prime lens. If you have a 50, now it's 100. You do not lose resolution. You do not lose sensitivity. So with a lot of ENG cameras, for instance, like Greg here works for a station in Seattle. They have the PMW5 renders. They have a digital extender mode where they can take their 1080 zoom. And let's say it's a, a later, uh, later shoot. And I don't want to drop in my doubler on my lens because I'm going to lose a stop and a half, two stops. I can use this digital extender mode. It's going to zoom in and give me a doubler. But I lose my resolution from 1080 to roughly 720. But I don't have any stop loss. So if I'm shooting later in the day, it's getting to dusk. I can't afford my, my doubler. I can drop in the digital extender. This is like that, but when you're shooting in HD, you're not zooming in below HD. You're shooting, zooming into 2K. So you, in, when doing it in HD, you don't lose any resolution. You don't have any stop loss. But if you're doing it in 4K and you do it, then, yes, you do lose half the resolution. It goes from 4K to 2K. Excellent. Uh, unless anybody else has a question in the audience and we have anything coming else online? I don't think we are. Another slide or something? OK, this is an example of where the camera can be ran handheld with a, a mount that can be thrown on the shoulder. It doesn't have to be these really heavy rigs. Now, certainly, there are some rigs that can be too, too gripped. Um, uh, you can have the whole back panel on there. You can have a whole film thing with a, a mat box if you want. It can be shoulder mount. It can be thrown on a set of sticks. I question think we for have a question out in the audience. Hold that mic nice and close. Speak nice and loud for us. Uh, my name's Sean Slobod, and I'm from Salt Lake, Utah. I'll shoot out in there. Um, sorry. Uh, just, just curious, what, what kind of interest you're finding with uh, the teams that you shoot for every weekend? I know you shoot some stuff on the F, FS700, some stuff on the F55. Uh, if they prefer one camera over the other, if there is a, a big interest with each team, obviously with San Francisco there was, but in yeah. 4K, what kind of interest is, is each team kind of showing for internally produced or web-based stuff? Yeah, OK. Um, thank you for the question. Everything is relative to, and this is something I try to tell people that are making the transition from tape to tapeless, is when you're shooting to tape, it doesn't really matter what you edit on, because you're going to have to capture that anyway to bring it in as a file to land it in your NLE. 
the moment you record in a digital file format, you really need to look at your editing system first. And so it, the camera choice kind of will depend on what your editing system is set up for and if you have native support for one thing or the other. The FS700, which is really a, it's a 4K sensor, but primarily, unless you have the RAW recorder, it's, it's a, an HD recorder that can do high speed in HD. And it's $8,000, so it's kind of like a poor man's Phantom that does up to 240 frames a second in HD. And the file format that it's compressed down to is 24 megabits, so it's very efficient. And the video quality is staggering. So to answer that question, when people see the 700 stuff that's either I've shot or that, that, that when they loan them a camera and they shoot it, whatever, they try it with themselves, if they don't need anything beyond HD, that's all they need. And the 5 and the 55 would be overkill for them. But if somebody needs raw, like for instance, Terrence wanted raw to get, he's, he's, a, he's a DP, he's a, he's a still sure, he understands working in that space, he wanted the pliability of that signal. Now it came at a cost because he burned through a lot of hard drives and stuff, and he'll tell you about some other stories that were a bit of a learning curve, but the reality is at the end of the day, his 4K RAW that he generated from this $8,000 camera front end to a $6,000 back end and then bring it in created stuff that two years ago you couldn't get for under $100,000. And so in that case, it was a very cost efficient uh, solution that allowed him to do what he wanted. For the people that, that have seen the 5 and the 55, for instance, different sport networks and, you know, and in higher end production companies that might have the budget to support those cameras and then also the edit systems that can natively take those file formats. And one of the things we're showing in our, our workflow area in the 4K is that all the new major NLEs, uh, Adobe Premiere, um, uh, Media Composer 7, Final Cut X, they all can work with all of our, for, our codecs natively. You don't have to do plugins. You don't have to round trip stuff. The only thing that's not supported between RAW and XAVC and XD Cam and all that stuff in those formats is the RAW format with Final Cut X. That requires a bit of a plug-in, but everything else can be drag and dropped into your bin and start editing right away. So where unless the customers are in a newer environment where they have all these new systems, it might require a little bit of massaging the files with plugins or whatever, but it really comes down to their audience and what they have in terms of budgetary. But those that can afford the 55, because it's only 35 grand before you start throwing on lenses. It's nothing compared to some of the competition out there that's twice as much, twice the weight, two to three times the draw. And they're very popular cameras, but they are 2.8K cameras versus a 4K camera. And so it just depends on, you know, once they are exposed to this stuff and see what they can do and the flexibility and the efficiencies of it all, they go, oh my gosh, there really is no other better solution than a 55 or a 700 for my application because cost effective and flexibility wise, there's nothing better. Very good. Anybody else? Questions from our audience? I'm not, anything online? Nope. All right, Mike, I think we're going to uh, wrap this up unless anybody else has any questions. Next slide. Um, <laughs> oh. Oh, you know what? Actually. Oh, that's super zoom. Uh, all right, so let me, let me explain something. That's what we're I, I, about I mentioned before. this in the first question, I think, but this, this is really broken up. There's a reason why this is broken up. So I mentioned the 4K zoom and then going down to 720. If we go back to that, there we go, that one right there. So this is kind of a cropped version of it. We can kind of see in between the middle of the goalpost over to the end zone. And this is where the play occurred over here. I was, happened to be there shooting on the opposite end zone. And this is where we had one of our, uh, an F65 camera pointing right down the, the, the sidelines here. And the, the angle of view was the middle of the goalpost to the sideline. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this was ruled a touchdown. They're going under the hood. None of the hard cameras could tell whether he had stepped out or not. But we had this technology in place, and they showed it when they go under the hood in the stadiums. I don't know if you've been, but they'll show that now on the boards inside. It's not just at what you're seeing at home. So you can see it on, on the scoreboards. It's cool. It's kind of an audience interaction thing. Here's what the referee's looking at. In this case, when they zoomed in, go ahead and hit the next slide. We can zoom in and say, oh, he barely stepped out. The reason why this is so bad is because I went home to my hotel that night. Sorry, that's a bad habit. I'm on the road a lot. I went back to my hotel, and um, I had my laptop tapping in through Slingbox to my DVR in Anaheim. Right? This was in Lambeau, or in Green Bay, out in Lambeau Field. So I'm on there, and I'm like, ah, cool. So I pause it, take a screen grab there, save it off, to, send it to my cell phone. The other one, take a screen grab. So this is a screen grab from my laptop through Slingbox, tapped in my DVR in Anaheim while I'm in Green Bay. That's why this resolution that we're feeding into a 4K display. So this is an example of why you don't want to take low resolution and try to feed a 4K display. But this gives you the concept of the zoom in. So there's your 4K zoom in. And this was neat because it was ruled a touchdown. But when they saw this, and this was the only camera that got that he barely stepped out of bounds, it wound up getting overruled. 
they brought it back. They wound up not getting a touchdown. They wound up getting a field goal, and the game was a little closer and was uh, you know, a great deal for the fans. And you know, that's the kind of action that they can provide, or the, the uh, added value that this kind that's of technology That's a great application. Can, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I think we might have another question coming in. Do we? Yes. We, we are getting another question on Twitter right now. It's from Cheryl Kay. She's asking us, can you do editing on a laptop computer using 4K? Okay. Um, one of the things I mentioned at the end right there was talking about the different nonlinear editing systems. Not all laptops are created equal. When you're working with an edit system that can natively decode these files, and when I say these files, I'm talking about the 10-bit encoded XAVC 4K whether it's shot on a Z100 or an F55. You can bring these files in natively on the newer versions, and because you can decode that, they're iframe codecs, you absolutely can edit that stuff on a laptop, provided you have the newer versions that natively decode it. If you do not, then you may need to use a plugin to bring this stuff in. If you're working with RAW, then it might be a different story because you're going to need some computational power. You may need a tower or one of those um, you know, trash cans that Apple makes now. We have one over there, and that seems to be quite something to say, ooh, look at that. Well, you want to see the, well, no, I just want to see this trash can thing. But um, yeah, it's, it is absolutely something that can be decoded on a laptop, and therefore you can cut these 4K files because instead of dealing with the 2.6 gigabit per second of these RAW files, we're dealing with perhaps 240 megabit of 24P 4K, and this match cut, match cut, match cut, layer, layer, layer. You can absolutely do that. All right, another question. I wouldn't recommend Mom, it on Mom. an old laptop, but something <laughs> newer for sure. Awesome. We're getting another question on Twitter right now from Christy Vines. She's asking, which camera do you recommend for action water sports like wakeboarding, and can it get wet? OK. Um, just like any camera, um, there's going to if any camera that's successful, there's going to be some type of an underwater um, uh, housable, uh, housing for it, right? some submersible thing. So if you're shooting uh, above or below deck in a water environment, 700 has uh, kits. The 5 and 55 have kits. Um, we actually have a couple here at the stage um, on the booth. Uh, the Gates actually has a couple of housings that they have here. Um, but one thing I'm really looking forward to is, uh, you know, with the sensitivity of some of these cameras, like the F55, and I was at a producer's conference in January, and a guy approached me that does all this underwater cinematography, and he said, hey, I got to tell you, that F55 you guys have, it's the first camera I've ever been able to see the underwater bioluminescence with the proper color, but the sensitivity it has. Think trying to shoot the Aurora Borealis in HD. How many of you, I'm sure some of you guys have tried to do that, right? Not easy. Try to do it in 4K with all that resolution but also trying to get it where the picture and the colors are vibrant. You can get that going through these submersible housings with the F55, and he's just blown away. So there are a couple projects that we're involved in where there's going to be stuff above board with like some, um, some guys kicking around and then you know, with the bioluminescence that are kicking around. That, that, that's something that's exciting. And so for wakeboarders, yeah, you can FS700 be more handheld. Depending on the weight of the camera, it'll be more buoyant or not. But um, those are things that are, are widely available. And so the 700 is very popular for that because it's also a high-speed camera. And when you're generating that stuff, it's 24 megabit. You can take those files, drag and drop it into a PlayStation. I carry an FS700 and a PlayStation 3 with me everywhere I go, and I carry them both in, in the same backpack. And so as a demo tool for me, hey, I shoot this stuff. Here's all this content I've shot. It's high speed. I drag and drop it, and I just play it out with a wireless controller HDMI. It's a $300 device that I use as my media server to play these files out. If I can do that on a $300 media device, well, yeah, I can drag and drop that in my editing system, too, and just go forward with that. So FS700 is huge for those type of applications in HD, but if you need 2K and 4K, then you can go with some of the bigger cameras or record in RAW. Excellent. Great. Uh, anybody uh, in the audience, a question? I'm finding it interesting that all the questions Very are quiet. from females. That's <laughs> awesome. Very good. You gotta Absolutely. love today's sporting women. Uh, Mike, before we uh, wrap it up, unless anybody else has anything else, uh, anything else you want to add that we didn't cover? Well, I, I, there is one something. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware, but just yesterday we, we, we came out with two new magazines. The first one is the second issue of the Cine Alta magazine. It's been wildly popular. It's about 200 pages. That's a digital online um, magazine. It's primarily user written. So it's not written by us, although there is one magazine where I did actually write a story. But um, any of you guys want to learn stuff about this technology as seen by the users in the field? Terrence actually wrote up a story that's in our Action magazine, which is the second one that came out. 
So if you want to do a Google search on Cine Alta magazine, you can see the premiere uh, issue from January. You can see the second issue that just landed uh, yesterday. And then you can also do a Google search on um, Action Magazine Sony, and it's an ISSUU um, website. But uh, they're great tools because it gives you an idea as to how these are being used in the field, including post workflows. For instance, um, the Parts Unknown uh, show, there's a whole feature where the color, uh, art, color corrector basically wrote an article saying, hey, here's how we're actually grading this show. So it really provides good insight as an educational tool that, again, are not necessarily written by us as marketing stuff. It's just, hey, here's how it stuff's being used. So the Blacklist, yep. Big Bang Theory, all these shows that are being shot on the F-55, the F-65, uh, the FS-700, or any other Sony Pro um, piece of uh, you know, content. You know, that's a good tool. So those are digital uh, magazines that we've um, put together that are, are great references that you guys can share, download, use, and you know, watch on uh, tablets or whatever. So uh, with links also that go to the websites that show content in some cases. Excellent. I think we have a question down here. Yep. Hi, I'm Jason, um, and I shoot for TSN in Canada. Awesome. Um, you mentioned about you know, streaming to a server, and that's how people are going to play it. Obviously, um, F55 has been used for features and the organic look, which is great. But the demand will be off-air live 4K. Do you see that happening in the next five years? Or when, like, I mean, the crystal ball is hard to look at yeah. in upgrading. But when do you see it happening that there'll be the demand where everybody, not just for special projects, but needs 4K now? Yeah, and... and I think that's very much what we're talking about here in the booth. That's kind of the theme of our booth is not just you know, live production, but 4K. And you see on the, the board up there, you can actually see two 4K um, projections in an 8K display up top there. But what we also have here is the 55 in a 4K live environment. And this is if people are looking to buy new cameras for a studio, whether it be in studio or outside broadcast, whatever the case may be, they're doing it live whether you're recording on board for uh, later purposes or just doing it live through a switcher environment. We have switchers here that can do HD or 4K. We have the cameras that can put out 4K live. Maybe it's just feeding the boards in-house. Maybe it's also recording down to HD for my delivery now, but ultimately is it 4K to flip the switch and yeah, we're now gonna broadcast that. What's gonna determine whether 4K gets broadcast at the TV space is how fast these H.265 encoders can be brought around and when, when the uh, what is it, ATSC3 gets established, those standard bodies are going to determine what this data rate is going to be, what the, uh, all the subchannels can be, and all these other things that you, accoutrements you can throw into the signal, but it's got to get it from this massive amount of data down to something manageable to fit in that pipe. But what we're trying to get people to consider is that if you've got to buy stuff now, think going forward we can be flexible with your camera choices where it can be an EFP camera when you break it down but build it up into a studio camera configuration that can do your 4K live or down convert from a 4K sensor that's going to get great resolution down to an HD output to meet your live cut needs of today or your live game production stuff or your studio production or maybe you're doing something like the, uh, the uh, Academy Awards or something. You may be outputting HD but you may be doing a 4K live line cut as well to protect that. That's kind of what can be done today. We have those solutions here today. So it's just a matter of those in, in individual people that make those decisions to, do we want to have this in-house that, that when the broadcast is ready, all we got to do is flip the switch in our, in our server and we're done because we've already put that in place on the camera side, our server side, uh, as well as our switcher side. And we have all those solutions here in the booth. I think we have a question right here in the front did, row. Did that answer your question, by the way? We can talk offline. We'll talk about TSN and how I'm part Canadian and love all that stuff, so it's great. The question uh, uh, is, what part? Uh, we, we need the yeah, mic. Oh, I'm working on a surfing documentary and wonder what camera you would recommend for filming a sport like surfing that's out pretty far out there. You want to get a good close-up, and you don't have the budget for one of the more expensive camera setups? Okay. Well, the other thing to consider is if I have an underwater housing, how much space do I have with the lens? Because a lot of lenses, when you go under control, the lenses might extend out, right? I'm actually thinking from shore. The shots from shore. Oh, the shooting shore. from shore. OK, all right. So that just comes down to how flexible is your lens mount on your camera that allows you to adapt these various lenses. And are there modes, like on the F55, where you have a, an extender mode where you don't have to use it optically, uh, which is going to be more expensive in your glass anyway? So what's most common is, you know, two-third inch ENG EFP glass. So you get a 22 by Canon or a 
you know, Fuji or something like that. Most of those nowadays have extenders in them, or you can get them with or without extenders. So you figure with an extender, that's going to get you to say 44 by. That might be good enough. If it's not, then you have other tools that can do digital extension inside. So that's going to basically augment your lens options. And then it's okay, well, you're going to be using those, but then when you drop in your optical extender, you're going to take a hit in sensitivity. So you got to be shooting out and, you know, uh, trussles or something like that. It's got to be a high sky day, and you want to make sure that you've got enough light to counteract with that. The other thing is that if you're using a large format sensor and you're at the long end of your lens, if you're using, say, a prime lens, for instance, like Canon and Fuji, they now have these you know, 25 to 300 millimeters, or they have a fixed 500 millimeters, which not only trying to keep it stable, but also pull focus. And then when they move around, they could be surfing in and out of focus. That could be difficult. The other thing is that's neat, you need about that is if you have a 500 millimeter and you're way at the long end of your lens, depth of field is going to be very shallow if you're wide open, right? What you can do with these cameras, because so, they're so fast, you can stop down. And the trick is you can bump up the gain, because even at 12 dB a gain, it's going to give you two stops of clean added sensitivity, not gainy. So two extra stops. So the trick is, has been in, in these 4K sports environments with these cameras, is to stop down to 6, 8, 11 gain up where it's still clean and now your depth of field goes from here to here and then you use the peaking tools that we have with our displays to actually track focus and you now have a good chance of pulling focus as the surfer is kind of going up and coming at you on a diagonal line. Just go ahead and track it. Absolutely doable now. So it's just a matter of understanding and honing, honing in, uh, harnessing the tools that allow you to do that. And the flexibility of the lens is the huge thing. Okay, uh, we have another question coming on Man, Twitter. I can talk. I know, you're, getting, you're generating a lot of engagement here. We are getting response from one of our Twitter followers, Romel, who is actually streaming our footage from Lima, Peru. Wow. Yeah, he wants to know, is there any special VTR to record 4K footage to later post-production? Okay. VTR right now... No. Uh, primarily in our, in our 4K uh, live solution, that's coming out the back of a camera from a fiber interface going into, um, it's going into a base station that's uh, kicking out SDI into a server. And so the server is actually allowing you to take 4K at up to 120 frames a second, or you can actually, with that server, take two 4K signals at 60p each into one server, which is pretty unique. So it would be housed there, and then you could always lay that off to a deck or some type of an external recorder. That would be your tangible that you can then drag and drop. Uh, or what you can do is you can take it on the server and copy it off to a hard drive and then import from that hard drive into your, your system. So it's not like it's a, a tape deck. We do have something called the SR1000 that does it in the SR memory format. Um, but that's a little bit expensive. So I think the way that's probably going to be the way to go is really going to the XAVC server, which can do HD, high frame rate HD up to 360 frames a second, or 4K up to 120 frames a second. So that way, would into the server, export to a hard drive of some sort, and then import from that hard drive into uh, an editing system. So therefore, the hard drive really is, is your, 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 your tape deck. Very good. Uh, I think we're going to wrap this up. Uh, any last, I know we covered a lot. Uh, but anything else that you want to leave uh, us with? You know, I, I think um, for those of you that have, have, have worked with 4K and seeing what it can do from a flexibility standpoint, and I'm a guy that works with, I've worked with a number of production companies over the years trying to establish tapeless workflows and moving from standard up to HD and HD to 4K and all that stuff now. The biggest thing that you need to under, uh, think about, I should say, is really what is your editing system in trying to avoid transcoding at all costs. The ability to, to natively import your files is really going to keep the file integrity intact. And uh, you know, Sean can attest to this, Terrence can attest to anybody that's edited with this stuff, just like anything else, if you transcode or have to hop stuff over just to get it into editability, you're losing along the way. And you're compromising the fidelity of your signal. The same is true with your cameras. <laughs> don't, don't listen to the hype. Don't become a fanboy. Do your homework. Uh, work with the various vendors, you know, whether it be Red or, or Aerie or ourselves or Canon. If there's something you like, get your hands on that equipment. Try it out. Make sure it works with your edit system. Don't just buy because you read a post that you, you know, that you believe this person because it may not be the right fit for you. 
everybody here from person to person in the audience, everybody out there watching online, you're all going to have something that's different. And it's important that your solution makes sense for yourself. And the only way you're going to find out is to walk that path. And I recommend identifying three different paths you walk. And if you can get to your goal the best way on one camera choice or editing solution, that's the way you want to go. But the moment you record in a file-based system, the most important thing is really looking at your editorial solution first and making sure that what you got, you can natively bring in your files as file copies. If you can, if there's a camera system that you absolutely want and have to have, then upgrade your, your editing system to something that you're avoiding transcodes because you'll wind up spending, or spending so much more money by saving on the camera up front or saving on the, let's say that you buy a camera you want but you can't bring it in, well, you're going to wind up spending a lot more money down the line by trying to convert that just to get it and deliver it, rather than spending maybe a little bit more money to get it in a file format that you can natively edit and go. That's the way to go. Fantastic. Mike, I want to thank you uh, for your time. I want to thank everyone here and thank everyone online. Uh, we will be, uh, certainly if you have any other questions, continue yeah, to tweet. And, and, and sorry to interrupt, Mario. Yep, so right uh, for those of you that are here, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Sean is a 55 owner operator, um, and he's here from Salt Lake City. He would be happy to answer any questions. I'll actually didn't tell me that. I imagine he might be. <laughs> um, Terrence, he did say that he's okay with this. So uh, as a gentleman that's uh, you know, a, a very, very capable guy that also has worked with some of these tools, not just Sony, so he can talk to you about other things if you're interested in that as well. Um, but he's worked with the FS700 and the RAW recorder, so he can talk about workflows as well. But we have a couple of people here that have worked with these tools. So if you're interested in that, uh, feel free to take advantage. And you guys appreciate you coming. And thank you all for listening uh, uh, and watching in uh, online and stuff. And thank you for your time. And certainly, if anybody else has any questions online, Sony NAB is the hashtag. Yep. We will continue to answer questions. Also, watch out for the winner. Uh, we'll be tweeting out the winner of the Action Cam online at Sony NAB. I uh, want to remind everyone uh, our NA, so, Sony NAB Live series continues tomorrow at 9 a.m. And we have two other shows, 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And then on Wednesday at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Thank you again, Mike. Thanks, Marty. Thanks, everyone. Tune in. Thank you all.